Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle here on the We Are Libertarians Network, and we are excited to do another episode of The Path to Libertarianism, where we talk to prominent libertarians about their journey to this fantastic ideology that has uh, blessed so many and enriched so many lives, and few have touched as many people, not in like the Bill Cosby way, like... David Gay, of the, one of the admins of Liberty Memes, one of my uh, good friends, and I always enjoy talking to you. Uh, I, how should I address you? Thank you for coming on, but do you like to be called David, Dave, Dadman? What's, what's, what do you go by these days? Well, I think the first time I did an interview about what I do on Facebook was in 2016 on the Tom Woods show and he called me admin two of Liberty memes and not even my real name because at the time we had been pretty um well you were I underground wouldn't, I wouldn't well I wouldn't say we were being unfair but we were being pretty particularly um <laughs> direct in our um attempts to destroy Hillary Clinton's reputation right so I did not want my name out there during that election. Um, so I was admin two of Liberty memes when I was on the show, <laughs> but I created the Liberty memes community group. And one time I told everybody, Hey, you know, I don't really let people come in here to preach communism. Um, so I toss people that do that. Daddy cares. And <laughs> <laughs> when I posted that, everyone just commented, okay, dad, man. Yeah. And that's actually that's actually how I got that nickname. Yeah, you you've had an interesting journey from uh, meme lord to a charitable organization. But I want to start with how you became a libertarian. Like, did you and your brother Peter, who we've had on the program in the past, did you guys grow up in a libertarian household? Like, was it a political household? How did you develop an interest in libertarianism? Actually, I've told this story a few times. We we grew up in a pretty conservative Christian house, um, but we also um, we also just had this passionate hate for communism. Uh, we grew up during the Cold War. Obviously, Peter was born in 1979. I was born in 1981. Um, in 1985 or 86, I was reading a Calvin and Hobbes book. I think maybe maybe it was later on. You know, I'm. I might I might disprove myself just by this being published later. Um, <laughs> it might have might have been later on. Maybe I was five, six, or seven. I'm sitting on the on the toilet reading Calvin and Hobbes, mm -hmm. and uh, there was this one panel where he refused to take a bath, and his parents were like, "Well, we could just force you," and they throw him in the bath naked, and and he yells back at them, and they wrote in uh, Bill Watterson colored this in or in huge dark, bold font with pencil because everything on Calvin and Hobbes is like drawn with pencil. And it right. says, communists. <laughs> and I had no idea what that word meant at the time, but I could at that time, I was young enough to identify with not being, uh, not being uh, willing to go take a bath, what I'm told, or, uh, you know, I could sympathize with somebody who didn't want to do that. <laughs> I was a huge and, Calvin uh, and Hobbes fan, and I read all the books. I wonder if that's like one of the origins of. I, I mean, I grew up in a very anti-authoritarian household. Like, if you had a position of authority, you were challenged, which made me a very difficult child. But I wonder if Calvin and Hobbes has inspired a lot of other libertarians as we read it back in the day. You know, what's funny about it is sometimes I think that Calvin and Hobbes is actually written for people our age to look back and be like, oh, yeah, kids all feel like they're prisoners in their own home and all this <laughs> other stuff. Oh, that's really funny because now I get to be the dictator and uh, I've got four of my own. But that particular issue, when I saw that word that I didn't know, but I had a negative connection to because I could sympathize with not wanting to be forced to take a bath. Um, I saw that word communists and I said, that's, that's not a good thing. That's a bad thing. Right. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm really mad at, at that thing, whatever that thing is. And next time I'm being told that I'm forced to do something, uh, I'm going to call that person a communist. And, uh, that's, that's really where it got started. But very shortly after in the textbooks in middle school, or sorry, in elementary school, a lot of our textbooks back then were very uh, anti-Russia. Um, we were very so anti-Soviet Union. So uh, we were going through the Cold War. 
uh, if you know, I don't, I don't know what what the purpose of all of that was, but uh, yeah, but, it, it, like I feel like I, we're around the same age. I'm 37. Like when we grew up, there was a strong sense of America and patriotism and what the U.S. versus Russia meant. Like you know, it, it, once the the wall fell and 9/11 happened, and then you know America became far more anti-war. I, there's, there's not that like same sense of I, identity before the internet. You really understood like, I'm an American. I'm great. This is the best communists are bad. You know, now it's, it's much more pluralistic. Like everybody's good. You well, know, like, the, the evils of communism were very present back then as well, though. We can't right. be mistaken about that. You know, people were being tortured and murdered, you know, and by, by the millions in china and and in russia uh in the soviet union um under you know under stalin under mao under several others that that took their place under uh, khrushchev um in cuba under fidel castro uh and in cuba under fidel castro up until basically his death and the castro regime although the figurehead is no longer raul castro he's still in charge of the uh, national assembly which basically means well, I, I don't know if I'm terming that right. He's not technically in charge of the National Assembly. I think he's still a member of the National Assembly, but he's the president of the Communist Party of Cuba, and it is a one-party rule country. So if you step out of line with the boss of the party, obviously you're in trouble, whether you're the president or not. So the Castros still run Cuba. My wife is a political refugee from that country. Uh, her, her, her father was a political dissident in Cuba. And funny thing, we talk about the Cold War and Ronald Reagan and all this stuff. And he was actually in the most trouble because he used to blast the uh, transmission of Radio Free Cuba, uh, which is a U.S. government-backed and Cuban uh, exile radio program that just transmits American stuff straight into cuba and anti-communist stuff straight into cuba and this was back in the back in the 80s and he would crank the ronald reagan speeches so the entire neighborhood would hear them right so he i mean this is in an oppressive regime and he wasn't afraid of of the consequences of doing that he was like you guys hear this this dude is telling the soviets off he, hence and, why and, and hence why she grew up in America. <laughs> well, no, no, she did not. She is a political refugee. She came here in 1998. Really? Okay. Yes, my wife is a political refugee. We we actually we only speak Spanish at home, um, not because she doesn't speak English or because I only speak Spanish, but just out of convenience, I speak both. So actually, Spanish has been my first language most of my life. Interesting. Yeah, people don't know that about me. Um, and to connect all of this. Um, in 1994, so she came in 98, but in 1994, there were uh, refugees during the raft crisis. It was called the Balsero crisis, and people would basically get on. It was called a balsa because it's basically made out of balsa wood, you know, you know what you would do in the arts and crafts projects. <laughs> um, it was called balsas because they made these rafts out of anything they could find to get out of Cuba when the Soviet Union collapsed. And the reason they needed to get out of Cuba when the Soviet Union collapsed is because Cuba was a Soviet satellite. Right. And there are actually a lot of former Soviet satellites that are still communist. And uh, they've really got no way around it. They, they stayed communist for the convenience of the Soviet Union subsidizing their economies. And once that ended, there was there's just no food. But, you know, when there's no food, sometimes dictators get get away with abusing people even more. They can they can starve their enemies to death. Um, but in Cuba, yeah. in 1993, 1994, during the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the fall of Yugoslavia, um, the Cubans just ran out of food. And they said, if we stay on this island, we are going to starve to death. So we're going to risk our lives 90 miles uh, in the ocean in some of the most treacherous water in the world um, with currents that will take you out into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or currents that will take you into the middle of the Gulf of Mexico and swirl you around for days until you dehydrate and die. And uh, 
and if your boat sinks, you'll be eaten by sharks. You'll drown. All these horrible things. You know, children who washed up on deserted islands and couldn't find fresh water would die almost immediately because they would get thirsty and re and reject their parents' advice not to drink seawater. They would sneak out at night and drink seawater, and that will kill you immediately. By the way, I remember this was like a huge controversy in the '90s when we were growing up. Like. The, the the rafts coming through and should the coast guard go save them and the right was always like no and the left was like we need to save them. you know it was it, it's it was it's weird because they were escaping fraud. communism so there was actually some overlap um and there were a lot of republicans involved in the cuban adjustment act i think the cuban adjustment act itself actually has a republican senator's uh name on it wasn't it they so, had to like they had to put a foot on american soil to claim asylum and that was like the part of the yeah, so, so that was a clinton policy called wet foot dry foot mm. um basically if you reached dry land in any fashion or you were out of what was considered the borders of the ocean uh you could you could say that you had reached the united states and you could officially apply for political asylum um and if you did not you would be brought back i don't know if that was the clinton era or if that happened later on um i can't remember exactly i used to have all of this stuff really sharp but i'm an old man <laughs> with four kids to take care of and a meme page to run um but the uh but my wife, for example, she came as a political asylum applicant from Cuba. So her father was a political prisoner uh, because of these actions. He was in concentration camps on numerous occasions. And when I say concentration camps, that is what he calls it when he talks about it. This is hard labor. You know, they send you to the sugarcane fields and, and you know, sugarcane harvest is not easy. No, um, it's they'll, brutal, they'll leave horrible you, work. They'll leave you with no food and you end up going in the field around the jail and grabbing up different types of grass and putting them in your pocket to eat a salad in your cell at night. Um, and when you get back to your cell, there's a guard that tells everybody to turn out their pockets and there's just grass falling out everywhere because everybody's starving. I mean, this is the kind of thing that a Cuban concentration camp in the late 80s and early 90s looked like right so so we, we're talking about only a few years ago this stuff was still going on in cuba and it's still going on today so when people talk about oh well they're a softer type of, of communism because look you can go there and it's a beautiful island paradise well just because palm trees grow there and it has beaches and they have one really 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 nice hospital for tourists and foreign visitors doesn't mean that it's any stretch of paradise and communism has done this to these people so when this generation is like oh yeah communism's not that bad but anyway the whole <laughs> point of this is that was my motivation you know being kind of anti-communist has always been sort of a, a kind of my gateway to libertarian philosophy um, because because we're the anti-authoritarian um philosophy um but i in the from 1999 to about 2006 worked with an agency that helped cuban baseball players escape from cuba and i would actually travel around the world inciting the desire to play major league baseball in various cuban baseball players and several of them as recently as this week have admitted that i was their inspiration for leaving cuba uh, there was a live stream of a pitcher for the Miami Marlins, most recently in major leagues for the Miami Marlins, I think he plays in the KBO now in Korea, uh, Odrisa Merdespaini, was giving an interview about his defection. And by the way, I was I was involved in encouraging him to this, to, to escape. And, um, and one of the comments came from a pitcher from his team in Cuba that says, I should have defected with David in 2002 in Italy. That's crazy. So how did you? How, and like, he tagged how, how me. You, he tagged me on the comment. So I knew that. <laughs> how did you like, end up doing that? Like, how, were you? So were you really into baseball, and then ended up like going to Cuba to yes. scout, so, or so, what? So I have a. So I have a, a lot of really fun stories about how I got where I am today. Um, in the nineties, 
when those raft people were processed, they were brought to Syracuse from Guantanamo. So they would process them at Guantanamo Bay and bring them to different cities in the north where there were emerging industrial markets so that they would have jobs and be able to work in little factories and things, putting together cable connectors or whatever. And um, when they came to Syracuse, they called my pastor. Apparently, the chaplain in Guantanamo went to seminary with my pastor and said, when you get to Syracuse, call this guy. He'll hook you up. So my pastor says, hey, I got this call from these Cubans. Um, you're taking Spanish in high school, aren't you? And I was like, well, probably like level one. Uh, <laughs> Hola. First, first couple of months. Well, I knew a little more than that, oh, uh, actually. Oh, I, hey, I, <laughs> I knew a I know a little more than that because I hung out at the baseball stadium a lot and was already trying to learn Spanish from some of the Venezuelan and Puerto Rican players. Yeah. Um, and I'm talking about like legendary baseball players like Carlos Delgado and stuff like that. Um, they're, they're the ones who played minor leagues here in Syracuse. Um, but I, uh, I said, yeah, probably the first level, but sure, let's go. He says, well, you're my interpreter. <laughs> so awesome. and and he actually grew up for the first few years of life in Mexico because he was a missionary kid and uh he just he just didn't remember he he only spoke spanish as a child and didn't remember he's just a gringo at this point um but i went over there and within a few months i was speaking spanish fluently like a cuban and so i've spoken spanish and sympathized with the cuban community ever since way back then 1994 and uh I met a few famous Cuban baseball players on their way through the minor leagues. We became friends. And then I found out that an agency in my area was actually involved in some of these people's escapes. And so I called the guy up and I said, hey, I'll come work for you because uh, I speak Spanish like a Cuban. I'm already in the Cuban community. I already know half of these ball players." So he's like, all right, get your passport. We're going around the world. That's so. Crazy. So I ended up eventually through that little spy work, I, you know, we would like send micro notes to people inside of a pen and say, oh, if you want to defect, give me a call and wrap it inside of the ink and put it back inside of the pen and hand it to them, ask for an autograph and say, keep the pen and go read it in the bathroom, things like that. It's like literally just like that bridge of spies stuff. And it was like, That's so it's cool. a lot, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I guess it paid the rent, but I didn't really become extremely wealthy at it. But I did inspire a lot of people to reject the Cuban communist sports system. And I'm really proud of that because a lot of those people became millionaires. So how did you how, if somebody came to you and said, I want to defect, what was the process then? Well, you just have to figure out the circumstances. I mean, do you have your passport available? Do, you know, do you? Do you have access to the visa that proves you're allowed to be in this country for at least 90 days because you're in this baseball tournament? Things like that. It's, oh, okay. So uh, hold on. Know. Like, so they'd come to Syracuse to play like in an exhibition? No, 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 no. Not Syracuse. Like Italy, Dominican Republic, Mexico, Panama. Okay. So they're Ecuador. in another country and then you help them just go, we're going to go instead of Cuba, you're going to go to America and claim asylum? No, no, no. Basically, you're going to walk. You're just going to leave your team here in this country and figure out where to go from there, whether we can get a politician in this country to accept your asylum request or they send you somewhere else. Most of those countries were friendly to U.S. policy and would not immediately send those people straight back to Cuba if they said they didn't want to go. Hmm. So so that was that process. But I ended up on an episode of the Cuban version of CSI. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I say, well, their version is a propaganda version for the government. but pretty much every csi or police show in any country is basically propaganda for the yeah, government right. um you know some of the some of this stuff is true you do have to catch bad guys um but the cuban version has me as some horrible criminal who wanted to destroy the cuban sports system so that the americans could get more gold medals in the olympics that's so funny and uh that's really really funny um but there's a whole episode that basically surrounds a phone call that i made to a baseball player and it also has a letter one of those micro notes that i had given to one of the players and it has my full name and signature on it and you can find it on youtube that's so what, what's like if i want to look up on youtube like what keywords should i use I'll send you the link but you would have to speak spanish it's called casa it's called um 
tras la huella, which means following the clues or following the prints. Uh -huh. And uh, and the episode is called Caso Asedio. And I think on link one of two, it is at about the 16 and a half minute mark. And literally a bunch of communist police officers with their uniforms on discussing how Fidel had told them that and, and how Fidel had given speeches about how these Americans were trying to destroy Cuban sports. And then he says, so I'll show you an example right now. And he puts it up on the board and it's just like straight, the full screen for a few seconds is just breaking down my letter to a baseball player who happened to be the captain of the Cuban national team at the time. Mm, yeah, my girlfriend speaks Spanish. She's a Spanish teacher. So I'll have her uh, explain it to me. We'll put that in the show notes. So when do you make the transition to like calling yourself a libertarian? Like what was the catalyst that made you go immediately? What I believe? Im immediately after that, actually, um, in 2006, I believe, or 2007, I was working in. Yeah, 2007, I was working in Mexico uh, with some ballplayers that were already out of Cuba. But at the exact same time, there was an there was a there was a shift in the dynamic of how Cuban baseball players escaped from Cuba. And what that meant was instead of already having your passport and your visa and just leaving Cuba at an international tournament where you were already free, um, players started paying or making deals with back end deals for their contract with migrant smugglers mm -hmm. and mafia types you know, boat people with really, really fast speedboats that you would use to smuggle tons of cocaine. Um, and sometimes it was the people and the cocaine being smuggled, by the way. <laughs> and um, the territory I was in in Mexico was also their territory. And they knew that I was there and I knew that they were there. And one of them figured out a way to convince me to come over for a barbecue. And I was probably actually the uh, object of the barbecue. Mm. they they called me up when i was on my way there and one of them that i had become friends with called me up and said where are you uh uh you on your way i said yeah i'm on my way he says uh, why don't you stop over at that little cafe that's on whatever street here in in yucatan and he said uh just just wait for me there he comes over and he says listen you know all those bodies that have been watching up on the beach in cancun <laughs> Like, you know, all this, like it was in the news. This, I think it was international news at the time between 2006 and 2007, headless bodies washing up on shore in Cancun. Yikes. And uh, basically the guy told me you were about to be the next one of those. Yikes. Why don't you just go back to New York and live your life and be happy? And I said, you don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was literally on the, ex I was literally went straight back to my apartment and I was on the next flight home. Yeah. You're and like... I didn't even, I didn't even tell my boss about it. Like I called my family. I was like, guys, buy me a plane ticket. I'm going to come home right now. Right. And what's funny about that is you hear all these evil stories about organized crime. And yes, they are evil. They will murder you. But one thing that they have is they'll actually warn you before they kill you. And you do probably have a chance to say, you know what? I'm not going to F with these guys. I'm out of here. Yeah. So sure, they were forcing me to make that decision. I, it was either my death or go home. But they at least told me first. <laughs> they were polite in warning you <laughs> yeah. that you were going to be beheaded. When I got home, when I got home, uh, my brother was involved in a Ron Paul meetup group. And, and what year was this? Like, this would be 2007. Okay. And I think November of 2007. And I was like, oh, Ron Paul meetup group. That sounds really fun because in 2006, I had already been looking into Ron Paul as a potential next candidate for president for us because. I was a Republican and I wanted to win the White House. Right. And I wanted to keep the White House despite the unpopularity of George Bush's foreign policy specifically. I voted for George Bush in 2000 because he was the anti-war candidate in, in, in terms of I'm going to be the anti-Bill Clinton foreign policy. We're not going to Kosovo, Serbia, Bosnia. We're not going to Haiti and Somalia and Famously going all around the world. We're not going to be nation builders. Yeah. He, mm -hmm. he said very specifically, I am not here to be a nation builder, you know, uh, 
in even I think the vice presidential debates went the exact same way against Al Gore. And it was a rejection of Al Gore and Bill Clinton and their foreign policy of that era that brought us a lot of the problems that we have today. And so I was at the time and I remember being a kid and listening to Rush Limbaugh during the Bill Clinton era, and he would talk about how disastrous Bill Clinton's foreign policy was. And that made me say, you know, this nation building is a bad idea. It was Rush Limbaugh that convinced me of this. And right. this was, you know, so I remember when they were ideologically consistent, or at least they were pretending to be because there was a Democrat in office. And so I wanted that to win. So I voted for George Bush in 2000. And by 2004, I actually abstained. I didn't vote. And but but I still wanted my team to win the White House. And I said, so what we need is all of that good Republican stuff and anti-war. And then Ron Paul came along and I said, oh, in my naivete, I said, we can't lose. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, had, I had no clue at the time what politics was really about. But that's November of 2007. And by December of 2007, I was already so deeply involved in his campaigns that I was attending a couple of the planning meetings for Tea Party 07, which was the original money bomb. Yeah, OK. It was like six point six point six million dollars in one day. We set a fundraising record that had that had never happened um, in a presidential election before in U.S. history, and this got like no news coverage. <laughs> I, I couldn't know. believe like, it. Like you think about the numbers, like I think Joe raised like two million ish. Gary Johnson set a record like two, three or four million, like. Six million dollars for a libertarian. Like no, a no, 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 no. It was like six million dollars in a single day. That's what I'm saying. Like the, the, you know, if you look at like what libertarian presidential candidates, and I'm saying Ron Paul's a libertarian candidate, even though he was a Republican at the time. Like that's a. It was when Ron Paul did those money bombs. It just was mind blowing for everybody because it was like the first. Like when I got involved in 07, it was still pretty like. Uh, a quiet movement you could know literally every libertarian leader possible you know and then when <laughs> when those money bombs hit it was like wait a minute we're not freaks anymore <laughs> like yeah. we have a chance well that is a testament to ron paul who started in you know he's been a libertarian pretty much his whole life right um I think he actually found libertarianism by working uh, a milk bottle cleaning factory when he was a child. I think he got like a nickel forever or maybe even just a penny for every single bottle that he cleaned at this milk, milk bottle cleaning station. And he's quirky this way. He noticed that every single coin that they gave him had differences on them and he could detect when they had, he's like a total numismat. And he could detect when there was an error on a coin. So apparently Ron Paul owns the greatest error coin collection on the planet. Really? <laughs> and uh, yeah, his, his own grandson told me this story uh, at the annual Paul family gathering just, uh, just a couple of weeks ago at his house. And he's like telling me this story. He's like, yeah, um, we all know that G-Ron, and that's what they call him. We all know G-Ron's got... We don't know where it is, but we know he's got every single coin that he's ever gotten in his life. <laughs> like, he still has he still has those pennies from the childhood milk bottle story. You're not gonna get the whole you're not gonna get a hold of my coins, damn it. Uh, <laughs> well, I think he lost them in a boating accident. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I, I want to touch on Liberty Memes and how that started real quick because I want to spend the rest of our hour here talking about the charity because that you know, this is airing right around Christmas, and this is wait, really important. Wait, 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 All wait. Right. I love you, but I'm going to finish this one part. Okay. The testament to Ron Paul's dedication is the fact that since childhood, he was a libertarian. And by the 1960s, and people don't know this about Ron Paul, by the 1960s, he was already speaking at trade shows for various industries, giving speeches about how getting the government out of their industry would help their industry. Right. And this is way back when nobody would show up at any of these things except a couple of industry geeks. And uh, by the 80s and by the time he became a congressman, um, there were a few libertarians on the planet 
and uh, a woman came to his congressional office and said, Ron Paul, you're a you're libertarian leaning congressman. Would you come to our college campus and speak to this young libertarians club? He's like, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, I'll do that. So he went to this young libertarians club to speak to them. And it was like three kids. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, this is we can work with this. We can get started <laughs> right here. And I don't know who those three kids are, but I am certain that they're still involved in the liberty movement somewhere and that they were really the ones that got this all started. But that's a testament to what you can accomplish when you're dedicated and you know that if you just keep going, you can multiply the amount of people that are involved in what you do. Yeah, his tenacity in and workmanship is really to be admired and really something that when you look back at the overarching history of the libertarian movement, like from, you know, back to Mencken, Meyer, uh, and uh, Albert J. Nock and like the beginnings of it to Ayn Rand, to Ron Paul, to Rothbard, to the Koch brothers and all the Cato tentacles that they built. Like it's a, if you look at the 20th century, Brian Doherty's book, Radicals for Capitalism is a great overview. Like it's a lot of hard workers who didn't have a lot to work with. And we enjoy the work of those people who toiled for a long time, like David Nolan, yes. who started the Libertarian Party in 72. He was watching uh, Nixon. Nolan was a Republican watching Nixon take us off the gold standard and got pissed and founded the Libertarian Party like the next weekend in his living room. And, you know, he was on the National Committee when I met him in like 2010. You know, he had, he had been working for 40 years. Some of these people who show up to libertarian conventions were at the founding. You can talk to people like Joe Houtman, and they just go, you kids don't understand how good you have it. Like, even you and I, back in 2007, like, you had to explain what a libertarian was. It's it's not something you – you don't have to explain what the word means anymore. It's – we're really spoiled by how um, much of a, a broad – awareness there is of what we believe and what we kind of think and it and we take it for granted we think oh people don't understand us but it's it's grown so much in the last 15 years it's really great yeah well i tell people all the time that say stuff like what you're saying um about you kids don't know how good you have it i say that to people nowadays um because we were involved when it was still very uh very grassroots and we didn't we didn't have social media when we did the ron paul money bombs i want yeah. people to understand this in 2008 or 2007 when we did raise 6.6 .6 million dollars in a single day for ron paul we only had meetup.com yeah i mean that was literally how how it operated uh, you know the, so it's it's getting better it's getting like i kept a list of all the libertarian podcasts it's still up at libertarianpodcast.com and like in 2013, I literally could write out the list. I mean, there were, when I put that lit first list together in 2012, 2013, like you, you, there were a hundred and there's way too many for me to keep up with that anymore. Like, that's the cool thing is that there are a lot of people who are starting their own shows. They're starting their own, they're seeing what you have created, what I've created, what other people have created, and they're doing it themselves, which is awesome because then that just uh, gets it gets people thinking about how to communicate libertarianism easily, quickly, in a fun way, makes them better communicators, expands it to their circles, you know. So you really with liberty memes, like it. There's a couple top tier, like first in libertarian meme pages. You know, being libertarian, I would say is one of them. Um, we were up to hundred thousand likes on the back of memes. But Liberty Memes was just like I, you guys blew up to six hundred thousand well, likes well, before we, you got. Zapped, we were the well, we were the pioneers. I, yeah. I I say that very confidently that me and my brother were the pioneers in libertarian meme game in as far as like making it making a page go huge. You know, finding a way to consistently spread only the Liberty message through memes. And we don't do that anymore. Every once in a while, we'll pepper in just something absolutely absurd just because it gets likes and views. Um, but we there's a lot more to what we do nowadays. But we were involved in Ron Paul's campaigns. We will say his name 100,000 times in this conversation simply because that's part of our origin story. Um, 
in 2012, when his presidential campaign was over, we wanted a way to continue our activism. And we had already been making memes for his campaign. And Peter created the page. He created Liberty Memes. And we just consistently posted the stuff that would spread the Liberty message. And it just started getting shared Yeah, by... A thousand people, then ten thousand people, then a hundred thousand people, and a couple of our shares even reached a few million. And by 2016, you know the story. By 2016, we were pretty harsh to Hillary Clinton, and Facebook didn't like that. And it wasn't really bad; it was just a innocent statement, obviously, because she was innocent as well, right? Um, it's uh, it was this picture of. Hillary Clinton with a smug face, and it said, silly Americans, laws are for poor people. And that struck a nerve with everyone in the whole freaking planet. Um, sorry, I say in instead of on because Spanish is my first language. Um, <laughs> because this was the day that the FBI had announced that they planned to announce what they were going to do with Hillary Clinton, and that was nothing. Right. And this meme went around the planet before people even had a chance to see the FBI make that announcement. So it made news before the evening news cycle. And that really bothered the people who wanted to control the narrative. Mm hmm. They wanted that story to be, hey, the FBI said she's clean. Your allegations are unfounded by, right. which we've seen them do nowadays. You can't talk about what happened with Bunter Hyden um, or any of those things. And so, <laughs> you, you know, like, it, it, you're so, so it right in them. that, like before 2016, memes were like advice animals. They were bad luck, Brian. They were simple. They were like corny dad jokes. 2016 was really like it's why it's called the great meme war of 2016 and the great meme war of 2020 did not live up i did not think that the memes were all that great but like there was something special partly was it was because trump was so unique and funny and different and then there was also like a peak in the world of memes where everybody had gotten so good at certain skill sets over the last like three or four years that by 2016, it was just like, everybody's like, oh, I'm gonna apply this to politics. And memes now are the main way to control public opinion. Like if you look at all these big outrages of, you know, let's look at the big things, COVID, the election, BLM and protests, like people think in terms of memes and what their memes say, not in terms of in-depth articles that the New York Times reports. And 2016 was the origin of that. I think you're totally right. Like, and I hadn't really thought about it like that, but 2016 was like the beginning of controlling public opinion with memes. Am, well, am I right in that? Well, I will tell you, you are right. And there's more to that story. And it starts with the boys from Liberty Memes. Mm -hmm. In 2013, I was running for city council and I had been endorsed by Ron Paul and he even we even made a hokey little video and I'm like talking about the Constitution or something it was all nice and corny and all really good libertarian stuff. Anyway, I was running for city council and my campaign relied on a lot of memes to talk about what my opponent, the current, the current city councilman had been up to. And we even we even had a very public issue that we just absolutely destroyed the guy on. And most of that was based on memes, the way we did it. Um, and my campaign manager, who was also a Ron Paul supporter at the time, in 2013, he learned my strategy. He ended up, and I don't know if it's current or it was halfway through this current term, but he ended up working in the White House as Donald Trump's charged affairs over social media right what i'm saying is the meme president the guy behind him one of the guys behind him was actually my campaign manager and learned meme politics through my campaign that's awesome so that was in 2013 
Now, mind mind you, at the time, I was still a registered Republican and still trying to win public office under the Republican Party name. And so Peter was already going off with Liberty memes, and I was using my political campaign page with memes. But I didn't want the two worlds to collide too quickly because Peter was already getting really, really, really deep into anarcho-capitalist territory. And uh, that scares a lot of Republicans. And so Peter, your brother is kind of like a pipe smoking intellectual in my mind. You know, yeah, Peter, he, that's precisely what he is. And he's got a philosophy degree from Covenant College in, in Georgia uh, in down there in Chattanooga in Tennessee. I, I say that because it, it's basically in both states. <laughs> um, but Peter, yeah, Peter was posting all this stuff and he was like, I don't care what people think. This is our philosophy, isn't it? I'm just going to post everything that, that lines up with what we what we believe here. So he was doing that. And I was kind of scared. And and even at events, so I was a speaker at the, the Young Americans for Liberty State Convention. And even at that event, I was afraid that those, I was like, I didn't know just how deep into Republican territory y'all would be. And I even knew that their founder at the time, Jeff, Jeff Frazzi, had been deeply involved in Ron Paul's campaign. So I knew that, but I wasn't sure if the whole organization was geared toward Ron Paul Republicans or if it was trying to just be Republican light. I just couldn't tell. And so at the registration de desk, one of their leaders was looking at Liberty memes on his laptop. And I was trying to keep it quiet that I was the guy from Liberty Memes. And I walked by the desk a few times and I'm like, man, he's really going to town on Liberty Memes. And I sit down next to him and I was like, hey, um, you know, I'm a speaker at this event. You invited me because of my activism and this other stuff I'm involved in. But I'm also one of the admins of that page. Me and my brother co-founded it. And he's like, no way, no way. I can't believe it. And this is back in 2013 or 2014. I can't remember which, but he's like, oh, no way. I can't believe it. And this is like telling everybody. And then by that time, I basically told the world, yeah, I'm an ANCAP. I'm the guy who runs, I'm one of the guys that runs Liberty memes. And, yeah, there's and, something and it was really popular. There's something, and I think about those days where, especially in the early days of memes, you kind of go, should I post this? I don't want my reputation to suffer. My grandma follows my Facebook page. You know what? There's something liberating about giving up that idea and and not worrying about what other people think. And I'm just going to post it. And some of that may have gone too far and we haven't checked ourselves well, too well. But like, I mean, well, there I'll is something liberating about that. I'll give you a rule for that, though, because Liberty Memes grew because we were able to reach everybody, not just libertarians. Yeah. And we were able, and I guarantee you, and I can promise you, I have received thank you notes from more than a thousand people that say thank you, Liberty Memes, for slowly bringing me around, and now I'm full on libertarian. Right. And this was with a memes page. We were someone's reason to look into libertarianism and become one because they saw a meme that they weren't sure why it resonated with them. They disagreed with it, but they weren't quite sure why it felt like it might actually be right. That's and, I've had I've had the same sort of success with high school friends and normies. Normies like me better than libertarians, like because I post I'll post Christian memes or slice of life memes and then libertarian memes and then over a period of like five years people go and you know those memes made me think like it is more effective than people realize yes it is so we built a huge audience we were abused by facebook all this other stuff but in 2018 in march of 2018 i said we have this huge audience and i had also been a speaker at a lot of rallies like gun rallies liberty rallies uh speaking at college campuses peter and i spoke at the libertarian state convention in texas in 2016 as well um I really liked doing that. I really liked doing stuff in the real world other than just posting silly pictures with jokes on them. And so I created the Liberty Memes Community Group in 2018 in order to have a direct line of communication and organization with our page followers that actually wanted to be involved in libertarian action. And so we started that and it got really big, really quick. That's what she said. And see, 
That was a good one. It, it but, never uh, goes away. Uh, well, we're we're really perpetually good. 14. That's <laughs> <laughs> that's what she said. And so, gosh, what is wrong with us? So the Liberty Memes Community Group, um, the boys from Voluntarism in Action, which I think is an offshoot of the page Being Libertarian, which grew up alongside Liberty Memes. We we were the like the original Share for Share along with like a libertarian and i think libertarian girl and things like that and your page we are libertarians and we grew up doing a lot of that share for share and built our audiences that way and back when the algorithms wouldn't stunt us when that happened it would actually show the algorithm that we were more popular because big pages were sharing us too so mm -hmm. back then we could really rely on the network anyway they re they reached out to me because i had this huge group and they said, you've got a lot of reach and a lot of popularity in this group. We're trying to help a little girl get a kidney transplant. Mm. Could you help us with the fundraiser? And I said, yes, I sure can. This is exactly why I created this group to do things like that. And the results were amazing. We, you know, between voluntarism in action, being libertarian and liberty memes, we absolutely crushed every single goal for this girl. And it was like 30,000, 35,000, $40,000. A lot of money got raised through that. And I said, okay, I see what this, what this uh, audience is capable of. And I found out that one of our page followers was about to get foreclosed on. And I said, okay, what do you need to keep from being foreclosed on? And it was basically pay off the entire mortgage. So we did it. We bought somebody a house. And then I said, okay, we bought somebody a house. We bought somebody a kidney on the black market. What do we got <laughs> next? <laughs> and just people just kept coming out of the woodwork. They were like, I see your successful fundraising and I'm in trouble. I need this. I need that. There were some scammers who just wanted to get in on the action that happens anywhere in the world where you, where you're involved in stuff like this. Um, but it ended up being where people were relying on Liberty memes to clear their causes. And this is in the Liberty movement. They were like, oh, you got a problem? Go to Liberty Memes community group and, and suggest this cause. Uh, but we had not devised a system for how we would triage these. So they would come to us and if it seemed legit and it seemed really, really like they needed it or it was a really bad cause, you know, some bad situation, we would just put it out there and say, all right, we're donating to this and we're donating to that other thing and this other thing. We reached like 20,000 people. So we had the audience to sustain it. To be able to give like all 20, those. Yeah, I remember going like 2019-ish to the group and it was just cause after cause after cause after cause. It was awesome to see because like, in my mind, that's the fundamental premise of what, how libertarianism will work in the absence of a welfare state. Well, people that, who... Human humans see other humans in trouble and rush to help like that empathetic system that, that we, we really need to focus on because that's, that's how people are going to get helped in, in the world. Well, that system itself gets crushed by socialism. Mm -hmm. uh, socialism, communism is a system that teaches you that you need to rely on the government for these things. And when the government's not there for you, something is unfair in life. Right. And so when we grew up, and I don't fault people for this way of thinking, because when we grew up, most of us were in public school and in public school. What is the lesson? The lesson is if you need to mail a letter, go to the post office. If you need to get a letter, wait for your mailman. He's such a great guy. He's there in rain or snow or sleet or hail. He's here to deliver the mail. And if you have a problem, go to the police. If your house is on fire, call the fire department. If you if you've got a problem at home, talk to the teacher, guidance counselor. If somebody is doing something bad to you at school, go to the school principal. All of these things are government solutions in a government building, and that's what we're raised to believe in. So yeah, I the, understand at, when they say, you know, in a home ec, they're like, well, if you get to a situation where your family really can't afford things, go down to the welfare office, get yourself Medicaid, Medicare, get yourself uh food stamps and section eight and all these things so it is culturally acceptable in this country to be a socialist even though we don't call it that and so when you 
and this is this is across the board. There is no difference between a Republican district and a Democrat district in terms of acceptance of socialism in this country. So I can't go around the world. It's not good enough to go around the world telling everybody you're a socialist and that's bad. And that's why everything's bad in this country, because you're a socialist. And don't you see what socialism does? And they say, no, uh, socialism pays my rent. Uh, socialism pays my food stamps. They don't call it that, but we call it that. And it's like the meme of this lady screaming at a police horse. You've seen the meme. Uh -huh. She's screaming like she's just angry at this horse. She's just screaming some rally slogan at it. And it's just got this look at his face like, lady, why are you yelling at me? I'm just a horse. And so when libertarians are online just laying into anybody that doesn't agree with them and calling them, you status a-hole, you know, just going to town on them and being especially cruel because you're the reason that my life sucks. You're the reason we're not free because you're blind and you haven't woken up. It's like, that is no good. That does not get anyone to your side. And Spike Cohen actually reminded me of the ancient uh, phrase, nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. Right. Why aren't we reaching people on their level in their world? So that's what I try to do with Liberty Memes. When I fund a cause, I don't care if the person is a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian. I'm just trying to help somebody to prove that Libertarian theory that if the government were gone, we would pick up the slack. Right. So in terms of the welfare state, I think it's the greatest thing in the world that now we are proving it. So I'm going to get to this. Liberty Memes has helped raise over a million dollars in just a couple of years for people's causes. And what happened was, and you just, you said it, that the group was loaded with cause after cause after cause, but a lot of people were just there for memes. Right. They're like, oh, right. this is a meme group, and I'm going to get to see a lot of memes and harvest memes from this place. And it didn't turn out that way. But there is also, an, and I would tell anybody that complained, I said, we post memes every single day, and I approve dozens of posts that are memes as well why don't you check the group image gallery because it's got like 20 30 000 memes in it yeah but this is a problem that i find in our circles but i don't think it's just uh, and i hate to bash libertarians because i just think it's human nature like i don't want to be confronted with this thing because that would cause me to make a sacrifice monetarily time-wise like people don't they, they're i'm here for the fun and i don't want to be challenged or i don't want to be uh, I, I don't want to be reminded that people are struggling. I don't want to, you know, that, that, and so they, they go, well, you're, they, they wrap it in like, you're violating your brand by po not posting enough memes. Yeah. Like, no, we're here to, we're here to help people. That's, and I'm sorry that that's uncomfortable for you. Like that, that to me is how I always read that stuff when I'd see those comments in there. Yeah. When people say stuff like that, I'll tell them, yeah, check the group image go. But after a while it did become a problem where enough people were saying it that they were able to, the, you know, negative voices are able to make the whole group negative after a while. Right. So they're, they're, they're insidious and they have this way of just getting everybody to say, yeah, you know what, I'm getting sick of this. Right. Um, but for me as a Liberty activist and since 2007, extremely active every single day involved in everything I could possibly be involved in to support the Liberty movement. For me, I was like, I always take the put your hand on the plow and don't look back until the field is done. So for me, liberty activism is a daily life. It's a daily responsibility. So when, if, when I find something that I believe in and is effective and is making a huge difference in the world, such as touching the lives of strangers and f buying their house for them, you know, and being able to say libertarians did that for you and that makes a huge difference in that person's life and then they go around and they tell everybody their friends and family their civic organization their school their job libertarians were there for me who i i can't believe this they're they're the most greedy people on the planet they won't help anybody they don't believe in welfare that i can't oh, i can't believe they would they, they have some sort of a mutual aid system and for me, seeing how effective that was, I said, this is a responsibility. 
we have a responsibility as libertarians to back up our rhetoric that we will be there for everybody if the government isn't. Why aren't we just being there for everybody right now? You know, there are plenty of things that fall through the cracks of government purview anyway, besides the fact that none of those things that people want from the government ever come without side effects, such as black people being beaten senselessly or to death in the streets by the police. You're funding the roads and you're also funding all this abuse. You're funding the schools, but you're also funding bombing schools in Yemen. Right. So why don't we, and, and even the things that we get to, if the people believe that the government should be there for those things, but they're not, it's because the government's incapable of even getting to everything. But the, pointing out government incompetence is not enough. We have to have a solution on the other side of exactly. that. Exactly. But pointing out government incompetence, so we have to, we have to do it ourselves. We don't have to pr just provide the solution and say, my philosophy is a solution. No, we have to provide actionable material and say, this is right now how you can see libertarians already proving this theory. And for libertarians, I tell them, this is how you as a libertarian can convince society to be more culturally libertarian and lean toward voluntarist solutions. See, it is not enough to be active every four years when there's a presidential campaign and you think you can finally get some attention. <laughs> Go out and make the attention. You know, we so so it but it, it did become a problem in the group that people were complaining that there weren't enough memes and this and that. And so I said, look, what we'll do is we'll create a clearinghouse group called Liberty Memes Five Dollar Charity Club. And any of you people that are really, really interested in all of these causes and really want to help and do understand this mission, go over there. And the pledge will be that you give at least a five dollar bill once a month to at least one of the litany of causes that we post in that month. And that was it. That was the premise. Five bucks in the whole month was your contribution to an organization that could reach dozens of people a month and change the lives of entire families overnight. And so how didn't you like you I remember looking at your Patreon at one point and it was like one of the biggest on Patreon at some point. I mean, well, so we were, in the, we were in the top 500 in the world among about 160,000 Patreon accounts. Yeah, it was crazy. So is that so that five dollar club, is that when it really took off? Just I'm going to create a mechanism. We're going to fund it through Patreon and then. No, no, we don't. We don't fund it through Patreon. And I, I feel okay. the I feel the responsibility to elaborate very clearly on that issue because Wait. Patreon is a monetization mechanism. And so Patreon exists for me and my brother to get to get some sort of compensation for all the work that we put in. Ooh, we, I put in like 12 to 14 hours a day vetting causes, answering people, giving interviews, traveling to other states. Uh, and my travel is driving so that I can meet people in person at grocery stores and stranded motorists and homeless people and teach them about libertarianism. And if you right. don't think teaching homeless people is, is a way to spread liberty, I've got some stories of redemption of homeless people. <laughs> that I could tell you in a minute. But uh, this is a lot of work. This has been a daily routine for almost three full years now of almost 10 to 12 to 14 hours a day of work. And sure. then there's the fact that we have to get around the Zucker rhythm. And sure. there's the fact that we have to get around our suspensions on our accounts and our pages getting taken down. And we have to also reach an apathetic audience that whenever you're getting abused by Zuck and Facebook and social media has been very good at making libertarians apathetic because once we can't reach anybody, we feel like we're already defeated. Right. So when we start saying, hey, help us reach people, help us reach people, it, we just get the comments back. Well, it's no use, buddy. Facebook has already got us crushed. 
I know it's the, the, the most negative group of people I've ever been around. And I, I love you and what you're doing because it gives me hope. <laughs> like, despite the, the all of that, that you get. Dis, yeah. despite all of the abuse we get on social media and all the things that marking our donation links as spam and all the amazing things that, 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 you know, that we're trying to do and Facebook jumping in and saying, not so fast, buddy. Um, despite all that, that group has only existed since October of 2019. So that's only one year and basically one month. And in 13 months, that group has funded fully 85 causes. And those 85 causes directly impact entire families. And those 85 causes total $325,000. Wow. This is money that went directly to somebody in need. So we had a situation, for example, and, and, and three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars in a group of only, and because Liberty Memes Community Group may have twenty-three thousand people, but Liberty Memes Five Dollar Charity Club only has three thousand, and mm. it only reached two and three thousand because of Spike Cohen and Tom Woods and Larry Sharp, and hopefully now your 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 podcast. Um, it only reached that because we were I I drove to other states so that I could meet with those people so that I could tell them our stories and they would put me on their podcasts. I mean, this, I'm talking about driving from Syracuse, New York, all the way down to Houston, Texas, twice. Once to talk to, to MC a rally for Spike Cohen and another time to be at Ron Paul's house so that I could talk to Tom Woods. Wow. That's and cool. This is road warrior stuff. And on the way, I met with homeless people. I met with supporters of the page. I met with libertarian leaders, with party activists, because my message is it's not enough to be active every four years when there's a presidential campaign or just to be involved in politics. You, with a $5 pledge, could make a huge difference in our culture in this country outside of the political sphere. Just by donating to a GoFundMe and commenting on that GoFundMe, libertarians are here to help. Voluntarism is the way. Taxation is theft. Liberty memes sent me. So you can go through four or five hundred different, different uh, GoFundMes that are out nowadays that have been fully funded. And they're loaded with thousands, and I mean thousands of comments that say liberty, libertarians are here to help. And these are even causes that weren't even run through my page because we've inspired that. So around the world, people are getting their funding and it says, this is from libertarians. So, so how this, does it work? So if I join the $5 group, I pledge as a member of that group to give $5 towards a cause you select or yes. walk me through the process. Yes, yeah, so, so causes come to me from the Liberty Memes main page, from Liberty Memes community group, from our private group for patrons, which I, I try not to spend all my time just circling the wagons around our own people because we do want to reach other people. Um, but causes come to me from all these different places, but I also feel a duty to take care of our fellow libertarians because fellow libertarians should be prosperous if they're active contributors to the liberty movement. I don't think that uh, that it's good for our movement for people to be evicted from their home because then they can't spend time on liberty activism. That's actually why I have a Patreon. It's not good for me and Peter to not be compensated for good work because if we are compensated, and this is capitalist free market theory, and I've I talked about this on your show before, mm -hmm. you know, donate to patreon.com slash we are libertarians donate to patreon.com slash being libertarian patreon.com slash liberty memes these are places where you can help the people that you believe in who are out there putting in the work and making the country a more culturally libertarian place and just because you're not winning elections i've never measured the success of the liberty movement in in, in terms of poll numbers or how many votes we got because we are out here changing the real world in real time. And the more people that are involved in that, the more easy the campaigning will be when it's time to knock on their door and say, hey, we're the Libertarian Party. We're trying to get you to vote for us. They'll say, they won't say the who? They'll say, oh, you're the guys who helped my neighbor when her, when her dog got sick and needed an emergency surgery. 
Yeah, and you are a patron of We Are Libertarians, and we thank you for that. We are a patron of Liberty Memes. Um, when we had to trim down, we only – at one point, I, I went through a financial rough patch, and we had to trim a bunch of different things, and I kept Liberty Memes and Lions of Liberty. Uh, those yeah, are the two. I, so. I support uh, Scott Horton also, and I support Larry Sharp, and I support your page, and I also support Graftreon because Graftreon.com keeps a list of how many patrons you have and where your ranking is among the Patreon account creators. And so I have supported them for $50 a month. I think I'm going to trim that back because I'm not really getting much benefit out of it, but I did want to reward them for the work that they put in, in just organizing that and it, it actually helps us get seen by uh, other liberty organizations to say hey look i can prove that our organization is actually making an impact in the tech world by our patreon ranking in terms of content creators what what, what they're getting paid and so so uh yeah that's an important thing compensation for really good work is i mean just incentive and reward it, it, it's a good thing I, I don't I don't see whether that's anything bad in in, in th but we have taken a sizable chunk of that money as well. And I'm talking about upwards of fifty thousand dollars and put it straight back into these causes to lead by example. And that's money that should have just belonged to us and sat in our bank accounts or maybe moved me out of the ghetto that I live in. But instead of doing that, I said, this needs our help and people aren't donating right now. I'm going to lead by example. Here's a $500 splash on this person's GoFundMe, things like that to lead by example, to say, Hey, let's get going. I'm willing to put my skin in the game. You know, how about you at least get five bucks? So let's talk, uh, you know, towards the end here. Um, give us an, an example of those 80 some families that you've helped over the last year. Give us a couple success stories. Okay, so we had one, I mean, I could tell you one for any day of the week. There was one just last week. She said that she was broke and couldn't afford her rent or her bills or something like that. That's usually the case. And that meant that she was also going to miss out on Christmas for her children or for her grandchildren or whatever it was. And we said, all right, we're gonna do your fundraiser here's the amount of money you need to put on your fundraiser and put a little extra on there so that you've got a little wiggle room for for discretionary funds outside of just your regular bills and also do me a favor and create an amazon wish list for everything that you need actually this wasn't the christmas it was a woman who was a uh, she's permanently disabled and she's just freaking poor mm. I mean, and this is a case of a lot of people in America and people just think, oh, well, you live off of your disability check or welfare or whatever. And sometimes it's just not that easy. There's other things in life. It's just a single woman. She doesn't have any dependents. So she doesn't get a lot of food stamps or anything. It's just her. And she hadn't bought new clothes in, in maybe a decade. She's wearing the same clothes for at least five, six, seven years at a time. And I told her, do me a favor. Don't just put things that you, things that you need like immediately on your Amazon wish list. Don't just put deodorant and shampoo and, and razor blades. Why don't you pick out some clothes and add that to your Amazon wish list? You know, how, how did you, you how did you meet her? Who who did she direct message you? Did you were you brought she, to her? She heard about what we were up to and she found a way to message absolutely everybody involved so that she could talk to somebody because she was desperate. And that's the thing. We can take someone who's been desperate for years because nobody is there to help and nobody's going to care no matter what happens. And suddenly they come to Liberty Memes and we're like, hopefully this is something that's in our power to do. Because I have to reject maybe 20 out of every, uh, for every one cause we, we have, it's 10, 15, 20 causes that we have to reject just because they're not feasible for us to get to absolutely everyone because we're just one small group. And we can only really do one cause at a time unless they're really, really small goals and we're just buying a holiday meal for 10 or 15 people all at once and we'll post all of their donation links all at once and all of their Amazon wish, links, wish lists all at once. But, uh, but we, we, people reach out to us because they know that we care 
And if we're able to, we fund it. If we're not able to, we try to give them advice on how to run that cause as though they were us. So I have become a guru at finding ways around the algorithms and getting attention for causes and and not giving too much information when you're asking for money. So like there are people who are like, yeah, the reason I need this money is because I'm short on my rent because three years ago my dog died and I had to pay for the burial. And then my cousin Jeff had his leg amputated and I had to go be his caretaker for a few months. So I missed work and now here I am and I've never been irresponsible before, but I'm about to get evicted. And well, it's that's, like, that's one of my questions that I'd like to ask you. Is it that obvious? Like, how do you vet people? How do you know who's serious and who's, who's well, full of well, it? Well, things like that. Things like that do happen in real life. Lots of our lives really, really suck. I don't think that there's a single person on earth that can say my life has never, ever sucked. So there are things that sometimes it's just one after another. And, you know, sure, every storm has an eye, but after the eye, you're right back in the storm again. Right. So we do, but I do ask for proof. So I, I've, I've become adept at that. Someone snuck one scam by me once and I promoted it to the group. And that was in the infancy of the group. And somebody caught it really early on. And I told everybody and I was forthcoming with the group. I said, guys, we got scammed. I'm sorry. I feel this is my responsibility to have vetted this cause better we got scammed right to GoFundMe right now and get your refund. They will refund you and everybody got a refund. Great. We took care of that. We were able to bury that. We were able to say, okay, that happened. That's in our past next cause. And people said, you know what? I understand that this type of thing is given to happen in a charitable organization. So we're not going to abandon you over this. And we appreciate the fact that you were clear about it and transparent about it. And you got us all our refunds. So let's move on. What's the next cause? And that's how cool these people are. That's how amazing they are. But I can't express just how amazing they are until I tell you these stories. Um, for one, somebody came to me and asked for $50,000 for a little girl. Her, her family had to have her airlifted because she went into a coma due to the flu. Mm. This is a little girl, I don't, four, five, six years old, seven, I don't know, something around that age. And she went into a coma and she even went blind. And this was a major expense for the family. And just being having to be with her at the hospital was another major expense for the family. And we raised $50,000 for her, but not directly through the group at first. I said, right now, we're not able to sustain such huge causes, but I will give you advice. Here is step by step exactly what I would do if that were my cause. And if you want to take this on, and this is what I do with every single cause. I don't sleep or rest until these causes get fully funded or I know that they're, they're on a steady pace. When I see that a cause has slowed down, I don't sleep. I spend another couple hours trying to figure out a way to bust through the algorithms and get that cause in front of people again so that people are donating again. Is that by your posting a lot, posting different places? Like, how do you do that? What are uh, yeah, I mean, I've got various groups that I can post to and say, hey, can you guys give some attention to this or something like that? And, and I've got email lists and, and messenger lists and group chats and all sorts of different ways to make this happen. But in this case, I gave him this advice and I said, just make sure that when you're running this, you're running this as though the person in need was you. And you will get the results that you need. And so I told him also reach out to the local press. And he did that and it made his local press and it got picked up by CNN. Wow. And CNN obviously wanted this story because it was a good story for vaccination propaganda or whatever. They were like, oh, you got to vaccinate your kids. Look, this kid is blind and in a coma because of the flu. Can you freaking believe this? But they posted their GoFundMe link and it got fully funded on Liberty Memes' advice. That's awesome. And so that was one of those. But we've got these angels in our group also that when a cause is really, really important and the goal is really, really big, and people aren't necessarily donating to it, they'll drop $10,000 in an anonymous donation on it. Wow. And I know who those people are. 
but I keep their identity a secret for their sake because I know that if people found out exactly who they were, they would be hitting up their inbox directly and just saying, hey, give me a stack of cash. And that's not appropriate. And uh, <laughs> so, but we have one case in particular, and this hasn't happened yet, and I don't want to talk out of school, um, but he told me it was okay to tell this story. So I'll tell you, we had a family with, uh, the father was disabled or for a couple of months because of a back injury. Uh, so one of our group members reached out and said, hey, you know this family, it's a good, you know, these people were involved in the Ron Paul campaigns back way back in 2007, just like us. They were members of the Albany, New York meetup.com group. And I was a road warrior at the time. I would try to go to Buffalo and Rochester and Syracuse and Albany and Boston and just support the Liberty Movement's different meetup groups along my immediate highway. And so I knew these guys and they were great people, really amazing liberty activists as well, homeschooling their children. I think they've got five children and he couldn't work. So I said, well, what do they need? Can we buy them some groceries? Can we pay their rent? Can we pay their utility bills? What, what is it they need? She's like, yeah, well, that, that should be adequate. You know, three, $4,000 would be more than enough. I said, well, then we're going to do it. This is going to be our next cause. Just get their permission and I will make a GoFundMe and list them as the official beneficiary so that the money goes straight to them. And she came back the next day. She says, well, I got, I got permission, but um, I might be telling the story wrong, but she says, I got permission, but they just got x-ray results and it's not a back injury it's a tumor wrapped around his spine and he is rapidly declining in very very severe cancer and this is a friend of mine this guy is basically like a, a bodybuilder and very athletic very strong very tall guy he's like six foot four six foot five big strong guy and and, and handsome too like even my 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 niece had like a a, a girl crush on him uh, you know, she was a little girl and, and she looked and she's like, oh, he's so handsome, <laughs> you know, just a just an amazing guy. And to, to see him deteriorate that quickly is just broke my heart. But I said, I said, OK, we're going to make this fundraiser for fifty thousand dollars. And I have no freaking clue right now how we're going to make that happen, because our group is just not raising that kind of money all for for causes maybe five six hundred dollars or two thousand dollars or three thousand dollars maybe a high limit of five but we're going to raise fifty thousand dollars for him right now and on day one ten thousand day two twenty thousand day three thirty thousand day ten the fifty thousand dollar goal great and then the magic actually happened. You think $50,000 in 10 days is a, is a miracle. The magic happened. One of those angel donors reached out to me and said, David, I need their address. Because I, I know you've probably got to get going soon. But no, you're like, fine. I, I, my associate producers just walked in. <laughs> oh, okay. He says, he says, David, I need their address and I need their information because eventually the fanfare around the situation they're going through is going to die down and fifty thousand dollars is just not going to be enough hmm. everybody in the rest of the world looks at fifty thousand dollars and says wow you just you just became one of the high rollers of jeopardy champions you know <laughs> it doesn't work that way cancer depletes your resources very very quickly whether whether it's fifty or a hundred thousand dollars and he said i want you to know that once that fanfare dies down, if they ever end up in more trouble and they need more help, I'm going to be there for them. And even if the worst case scenario happens and he passes away, I want to be there to basically adopt those kids financially mm -hmm. where they will be able to come to me for advice or, or if they end up in a problem or in a struggle, they can come to me and I will take care of it. I mean, this is a person with the resources, so I know that he's he means it, and I've seen him do it before. And so there are cases like this where after we help somebody, another miracle happens. Somebody steps in and says, well, I'm going to go the extra mile. That I already thought, you know, $50,000, we were going the extra mile. Right. And we are we don't know it in the liberty movement. We are the freaking League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. We have so many people with talents and resources, and we don't know how to use them. 
Yeah, because I, we've got this guy who comes up to us and says, "I'm going to adopt that family for the rest of those the, from the rest of their childhood." I mean, you have no way to measure what that statement means from a person who's capable of doing it and has done it in the past. There's just no way to know. But we have situations like that all the time. So I have. In my travels, and I wanted to tell this story about homeless people last year, and I, I travel when I go places, I drive because I want to be able to meet people in other states and, and, and reach out to people that I come across because driving gives you a unique opportunity. If you are an astute observer, you will be able to see people who need help just right. by driving by, you know, you see a few bums on the corner and they're not holding a sign. It's probably because they're just freaking broke and they're not out there trying to grift anybody. They just don't have any solution in life anymore. Mm -hmm. And you walk up to them and like, Hey, can I buy you guys a meal delivery to, to have a bunch of pizzas dropped off at this corner? And here's a few $50 gift cards or $25 gift cards. So that you guys can go buy some fresh socks and things like that. And I'll, I'll reach out to the homeless that way. But you never know who it is that you're helping and what they'll do after that. There was a guy, uh, I, I discovered him because I was driving to the mall and in between the mall and a factory was parked lots, which were separated by a stretch of woods. It's a very thin stretch of woods. I'm like a stretch of woods that's probably as wide as a street, but it's just this strip that divides the two parking lots between an abandoned factory and the mall. And I noticed this was in winter in Syracuse, New York. This is where I live in the coldest and snowiest city in the United States. And so I was like, there's tire tracks and a single set of footprints going back into those woods in the snow. Somebody's living back there. And I'm a big guy. It was the middle of the night. It was dark and cold, but I don't really care. I was like, I'm going to go back there and find out what's back there. Because it doesn't seem like a single track of a guy walking his bicycle is going to be anything dangerous to me. I'll either find somebody who committed suicide or somebody's <laughs> living back there, you know? Right. Uh, I mean, that's what you think. So I went back there and I live streamed it and I knocked on the dude's door. I mean, apparently he was living on a, in a hobbit house that he had built out of plywood in the middle of the woods. And so I knocked on his door. He had a locked door and everything. And I knocked on the door and he opens the door and says, can I help you? And I said, dude, you're living in the woods with no electricity and no plumbing in Syracuse, New York, in the middle of the winter. How can I help you? And so he gave me. Oh, you got the Rona. Sorry. So, he gave me, yeah. <laughs> so he gave me a list of things that he would need, like thermal boots and a coat, a new coat and some warm gloves and things like that. And so I went out to Walmart and to Burlington Coat Factory. I bought him a propane space heater and I think like, like 16 propane tanks to go with it, the little propane gas tanks for the propane right. heaters. And uh, I taught him how to ventilate his space with that. And I brought him a brand new pair of thermal Timberlands that were exactly his size, like really, really nice stuff. Just I just wanted to show so much love to him. I bought him some new bedding, sheets, pillows, things like that, uh, a lot of socks. Listen, when you're on a long trip or you're walking somewhere, your feet get funky. Imagine being homeless and only having one pair of socks. It's it's a huge issue for homeless people. Like they They don't want to go to homeless shelters because they don't want their boots and their socks stolen. I mean, I can't imagine – I can't imagine – the fact that we even exist because of the fact that in the century before our birth, people didn't even have toilet paper and flushing toilets yet or toothpaste and deodorant. Like, I don't even know how anybody could be living happily ever after with crotch rot. Like they tell all these fairy tales about princesses and kings. And I'm like, we live in a society that has toilet paper. And you know what's funny about that is all these people who are promoting communism have never wanted for anything in life. And most of them come from wealthy suburban neighborhoods. And they're like, the thing I'm going to do for the poor is I'm going to make the government redistribute wealth. And I say, you idiot, don't you know that that's what causes toilet paper shortages? Right. How could you possibly want to live without toilet paper? It's like the greatest freaking thing in the world. Here in like, Indiana, I mean, they, they didn't here in Indiana. Toilet paper didn't hit till like the twenties, and people used corn cobs for toilet paper. 
<laughs> like, could you imagine that you you complain about the one ply, but you're so so a did your so your did your grandparents grow up there? Uh, my great grandparents did. Yeah. Your great grandparents grew up in that, and yeah. you exist. They I decided. Knew my great, I knew my great grandparents. They died in ninety seven. <laughs> and I don't know, and I don't know just how wildly in love people would fall. But I've read romantic <laughs> stories, and I've seen Gone with the Wind. People, ha I mean, people still had sex and still kissed each other, and still, and everybody was funky. <laughs> I and, think about that all the and time. Had, like, and had crotch rot. Napoleon like, crotch rot is the worst thing on the planet. Napoleon had won a uh, war or a battle and was on his way back to France. And he wrote to his uh, wife. He said, I'm on my way back. Don't wash. And I'm like, oh, okay. that's a different okay. culture. That okay, is a I different love, culture than ours. Okay. I love how we got off on this really dirty tangent because we're libertarians <laughs> and nobody can tell us what to do. Well, but, we're ADD first and foremost. <laughs> but this homeless guy. So I, so flash forward, um, a month and I went back to find him and his shelter had been torn down by the developers at the mall. Um, and he had been evicted from that space, uh, apparently to me. I was so come to a month ago and I was supposed to go to Houston to MC a rally for Spike Cohen. And before I left the house, I walked to the pharmacy by my house, which is and, you know, there's street pharmacies here, and then there's the Rite Aid pharmacy. I was going to the Rite Aid pharmacy. And along my way, I saw a cleanup crew just picking up trash, and they had vests on with the name of an organization that helps the homeless. That I remembered this guy in the woods had told me he was a volunteer for. But hmm. I saw a guy who was clean shaven and handsome and wearing nice clothes representing this organization picking up the trash in my neighborhood hmm. and i went over i couldn't speak to him because i just knew it was him and i went over to the foreman and i used the word foreman as a gender fluid term and <laughs> she said i said i said whatever happened to al the guy who was living in a shack in the woods by the mall and she immediately knew who I was talking about. She said, well, I don't know exactly what happened to him in particular, but one day he came to our office and he said, I feel like people care about me again and I'm ready to go back and live in society and live in a house. And he said, I need help getting housing because that's what I need now instead of going back and building another one of these shelters, which he had told me he had done three or four times whenever he was kicked out of a place. And he would just go and build somewhere else in the woods because he was good at it. He, she says, so I don't know what exactly happened. He came to our house last winter one day, and this was before getting kicked out, which obviously it was because I went and met him on his level and treated him as a human being and treated him as important enough to go in the woods in the middle of the night in the freezing cold winter and find him there and help him. That he and she says, so that's him right over there, and he lives in a house now. That's awesome. And there's no way to measure the impact that you could have through these individual interactions. But not only that, people say, well, how does helping homeless people promote liberty? I'm like, you guys, liberty is about teaching people that there, there's better things than government solutions. This guy is on a trash cleanup crew right now. He is volunteering for the people that helped him when he was in that situation. So he is now volunteering and helping the homeless and cleaning up trash and living in a house. How does that not promote voluntarism and liberty? I mean, that's that's the definition of, of why I do this stuff, because I know that any single person could be inspired to want to change the world in a positive way that way to volunteer. And the more volunteers we have on this planet, the more we can help. So we've raised $320,000 in a group of people that's not even active. Not everybody's active. It's like 200 people are active on any given cause. And with only 200 people being active on any given cause, uh, and only maybe 500 total being active in a month, we raised $320,000 in this group where the pledge is you're just going to give five bucks a month to one of these six, seven, or maybe even 10 causes that are posted to this group every month. I mean, 
the numbers are astounding. And some of these stories that we tell, and there's, there's way more of those. If you had, if I had battery on my phone and you had three more hours to do this, I would go through this entire list and tell you all of the miracles that have happened to all of these people that we've helped. Um, there was another girl who posted about being depressed because she was broke and she has a special needs child and she had a fundraiser that was going absolutely nowhere. And we found that two days ago and funded it within, I think, 30 hours. And she needed $2,200 to stave off eviction, to pay some bills, to other things. And I said, what are you doing for your kid for Christmas? Why don't you tack another $1,000 onto your fundraiser goal and don't worry about justifying what you do with those funds. We want you to have fun with it and enjoy Christmas. And she told her child, she said, and this is a child with special needs, beautiful young boy. I don't know how old he is. Maybe he's four or five. And she posted a picture of him with the biggest authentic grin on his face, a big smile, because she had just told him, honey, we're going to have Christmas this year. Mm. Beautiful. Man, I mean, it's just like it's just like the, and this just happened and this just reached its goal yesterday. And we didn't just add a thousand dollars to her goal, we added a thousand one hundred dollars to her goal. I mean, she's can do whatever she wants right now, and she's she's got wiggle room, and we do this all the freaking time. This is every single day. There's a story like this in that group. It's Liberty Memes $5 Charity Club. And you just give and there's no middleman. It's just I post a link and you give straight to the person in need. And then you get to see the story of the person in need because we bring them into the group so that they can thank everybody. Yeah, when we've done, I mean, and it's the fundamental message of libertarianism. I mean, the bureaucratic state, bureaucratic solutions robs people of their humanity because it disconnects the emotion that you're showing, the emotion that you experience on a daily basis as you're helping people. When you're connecting with people and caring for them, it blesses you, it blesses them, it builds a stronger society, it creates more unity because you're working together. I mean, we've when we've done charity, like we raised $5,000. I don't think I ever really gave an update because it was a sensitive situation. We raised $5,000 for a woman in our audience that was escaping a situation with an abusive spouse. She is thriving now in a different state, you know, working with other women that were in her situation. Like it's, I'm, I'm working with a woman people. like that right now. I'm yeah, working you, with a, a cause like that. Not our current cause. I'm trying to figure out ways to work her in. Um, we try to avoid domestic situations because domestic situations can get pretty messy and there's there's more to the story. Um, but hers is pretty unique. I mean, her husband got arrested for the abuse that that that's being alleged here. I mean, there was a lot. And, but he's more wealthy than her. She's out on her own with the kids and he's not paying the child support and he's not helping at all. And she's just being absolutely obliterated and crushed under debt and trying to survive getting out of this abusive relationship and rescuing her kids. And I told her, put together Amazon wish lists for all your kids' Christmas needs and for any material needs that you have. And we'll try to do fundraiser for you. Um, so we're going to be getting to her, but you have no idea the impact that you'll have in a person's life. You're absolutely right. It's just, it's, it's just, truly, it's just it's so amazing. Truly great. And then once you do that, it, once that person gets there, there hasn't ever been a person that I've personally like helped or been friends with that was in a tough situation that once they feel that dignity from another person that reaches their hand, and helps pull them up, they then start helping way more people than that single act of, of help initially. And that's one of the beautiful things. So to, to wrap up here, how can people, how can our audience, how can people listening get involved and help your cause? Well, I wanted to say one more thing, you know, human interaction is so important. Being human beings to each other is so important. And that's one of the most heinous things about these lockdowns is that we're not allowed to be around other people. I'm in, I'm in New York. I mean, the lockdowns around here are really extreme and none of us are sick. It's like, it's ridiculous. Um, but they've taken away our ability to be together as human beings and actually literally reach out and touch each other. And that is so necessary. And you've got, um, seniors that are dying in their in their nursing homes 
and not just from COVID because they got COVID or whatever spread around the nursing home really fast, but also because they're in their 90s and the last resource they have available to them to help their family is to give their grandchildren a hug. There or or to or to give some advice to their to their children before they die. And that's the last thing that they were planning on contributing to the world. They were like, well, I've got this amount of time left. I'm sitting here in a bed, but I'm still motivated to help my family somehow. Uh, bring the grandchildren and I'll talk to them about stories from my day. You know, they've been robbed of that opportunity and just want to die. They've been protesting and posting on posting notes stuck to their their bedroom windows so that passersby will see them that say, we don't care about COVID. If you're not going to allow us to see our families, we just want to die now. Mm. And that's what's so heinous about taking human interaction from people. But only communism can do that. Only communism is so inhuman that they don't care about the cost of something that they say they're doing for the common good. And so that's why what we're doing is literally the anti-communist solution. So you can be on Facebook, Liberty Memes $5 Charity Club. If you appreciate the work that we do, please join our Patreon, patreon.com slash Liberty Memes. We've also got Liberty Memes Community Group, which is pretty much the wild west of all of this. If you don't want to be offended by things, please don't join that group. <laughs> um, and then there's the Liberty Memes main page, which is pretty much just nonsense memes. So... And I'll That's put links to all of it in the show notes too. So people... and I'll send you I'll send you some links just so make sure you've got them. And I'll also send you the link about my story about being on Cuban CSI because that's a pretty funny one. Oh yeah. Send me the links and I'll put them in the show notes. David, thank you so much for coming on. It's been so great to talk to you and I love everything you're doing and, and hope we can partner together to to help amplify your causes a little more. The, the pleasure is mine. I want to tell everybody who was involved in political campaigns this year, if you want your job to be easier and you need something to do right now during your downtime, come over to Liberty Memes $5 Charity Club or start something like this on your own. Be involved in stuff like this and your job will be a lot easier in convincing people to support liberty ideals in the future. Couldn't agree more. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening to We Are Libertarians and we will talk to you soon.